Asmat Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Parama Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bionamaha. So again, um, we're continuing our discussion of the third Vilas of Hari Bhakti Vilas. The first two Vilasas, once again, were about finding a guru and taking Vaishnava initiation and all the different procedures for that and the mantras and the testing, the, in, the mutual testing between the teacher and the, and the student. Now we're on the third Vilas, which is basically starting about good conduct and what you should do after you get initiated, because obviously there's a lot of things that you can't do before you get initiated. So after you get initiated, you have to follow certain rules of conduct and you also have to make use of that mantra that the, that the teacher has given you to perform, uh, to do meditation, to do japa, to, to, to recite, and also to, to think about the meaning, the esoteric meaning, and to use it in the worship of, the, of Lord Krishna. So I'm going to share the uh, the screen here. We were at uh, we were up to uh, sloka 32 in Hari Bhakti Vilas in the third Vilas. So third chapter, 32nd 32nd uh, verse. Uh, according to the needs, sometimes a particular instruction is repeated. One who practices his devotional service should meditate on Lord Krishna's form and pastimes according to his ability and understanding. So that seems to be some general instruction. If we look back here, the last four slokas were, um, there, there, were there was, a, a, there was a, a lot of uh, meditation on Lord Krishna and meditation on, on the Supreme Lord uh, and what we call pratahas marami. Uh, or what we should remember when we get up in the morning. First thing we get up in the morning, we should think of something spiritual. Some people look at their hand, and there's different parts of the hand which represent uh, Lakshmi and different uh, and, uh, things, and they should, and, and the Lord, and, their, and Lord uh, Govinda, and we should, there's a, there's a sloka to, to chant, uh, I forget it right now, but, but you look at different parts of the hand. You know, as soon as you wake up, you look at your hand, you chant Hari Hari or Krishna, Krishna. Here it says Krishna, Krishna, and uh, some some form of the name of the Lord, and uh, and then and then you go on. There's some prayers to be chanted. So these prayers uh, are, are chanted. Uh, these are the prayers which are chanted. So there was a a set of four prayers um, about Gajendra Moksha, which we chanted after we got up, and there was also some other ones about Krishna and the Gopis. So now it's saying that uh, <clears throat> according to the need, and uh, sometimes it's a, a particular instruction is repeated. Sometimes when we see instructions are repeated, sometimes they're repeated twice or three times for emphasis, just as we do in, in, in other languages. It's the same in Sanskrit. One who practices devotional service should meditate on Lord Krishna's form and pastimes according to his uh, uh, capability and understanding. So what this, this, this verse is actually saying here, basically, is that there are there are some there are these you know five or six verses before or, or more that he's given as examples of prayers to chant when you get up, but there are many other prayers that you can chant, and uh, and we should always be remembering the Supreme Lord the first thing we get up in the morning. We should remember him always, but especially when we get up in the morning because we've been, we've just been sleeping, so sleeping is considered to be like we're you know in the mode of ignorance or darkness or Thomas. So, you know, we're asleep, you know, unless we're completely pure and somehow we're, we're completely pure when we sleep. But most people, they just, you know, they're, uh, they're unconscious and they're not thinking about God while they're sleeping. So as soon as we wake up, we want to purify ourselves, first of all, by chanting the holy name, Krishna, Krishna, and then um, by thinking, by then again, thinking of the Lord and his forms and pastimes. So that's what it says here, forms and pastimes. What is the same Bhagavad Gita? Janma, karma, chame, divyam. So my birth and activities are completely pure, completely transcendental, Lord Krishna says. And if you remember them, naiti mamiti, so you, you don't have to take birth anymore. So it's very important that we, wait when, that we remember Lord Krishna always. But especially when we wake up, we should make extra effort to immediately get out of our... Uh, our drowsiness from sleep and immediately start to think of the, um, the pastimes and forms of the Lord. Okay, so text 33, simply by chanting the holy names of the Supreme Lord and remembering him, one can obtain the result of bathing in all places of pilgrimage, 
and he can purify himself both internally and externally. So that's nice. So we also have this uh, verse from Garuda Purana that everybody knows. Apavitra pavitro va sarvavashtam gatopi va yasmare kundari kaksham sabhaya abhyantara suchihi. So the person who remembers the Supreme Person who has got lotus petal eyes, like eyes, Kundari Kaksha, he is purified within and without. So here it's also saying a very similar thing. If you chant his names, and here, here, here in the second line it says, Kirtana smaradadi, Smaranadika. So Kirtana and Smarana. This is harking back to the verse in the Bhagavatam that gives the nine forms of bhakti. Pravaram, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmani, Vedanam. This is uh, spoken by Prahlad Maharaj. And uh, it explains the no nine forms of bhakti. There's another similar verse in the Ramayana, which also explains the nine forms of bhakti. So out of these nine forms of bhakti, we have Kirtana being listed here first, chanting, and Smarana, remembering what's the purpose of Kirtana. The purpose of Kirtana uh, uh, is not just is the purpose of kirtana is not just, or chanting, is not just to chant. It's not just to repeat, but it's to hear that, uh, hear uh, either the holy name or to hear um, uh, stotras which exp explain the pastimes or even to, to kirtana can be recitation, parayana, what we call parayana of different scriptures. We can read the stories in the Bhagavatam of the Lord's pastimes like that and 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 the purpose for chanting those things is you chant them you hear them so here verse 33 we're, we're, we're on the second line we have kirtana smarnadikam so again we have this word adi adi means etc or beginning with it strictly strictly speaking it means beginning with so we have this word anadi means beginning less so adi means anadi a adi anadi is beginning less and adi means beginning so beginning with Kirtana and Smarna. So the important parts are, so there's these nine forms of bhakti which we're going to perform every day. And so when we get up in the morning, we start off with Kirtana and Smarna. Start off by chanting the holy name, chanting about the Lord's pastimes, chanting some prayers, which remind us of his forms and, and pastimes, and remembering those things, thinking about those things, meditating upon those things. So that's the purpose of Kirtana. The purpose of kirtana is to, to hear shravana and then remember. If we, if we do kirtana, if we chant the holy name of the Lord, if we chant the pastimes of the Lord, if we chant different prayers to the Lord or different Puranas or scriptures that speak about his pastimes, if we chant those things, then we'll hear them and we will internalize them. We will meditate upon them and we will become, basically that's the way to become Krishna conscious by engaging all the senses in thinking, uh, uh, chanting, and, and hearing, and and thinking about the Lord, the Lord and His pastimes and His forms. Okay, so that's very, very. It's a, it's not it's not the end of uh, devotional service. It's not the end of bhakti yoga, but it's the beginning. Uh, Adikam is, is important here. So so beginning with kirtan and smarana, beginning with chanting, and beginning with remembering the forms of the Lord, and then. We'll do some other things like serving the low speed, offering prayers, all these different things. Navada Bhakti. So continuing on, text 34 is a discussion between uh, Lord Shiva and Kartikeya. Kartikeya, otherwise known as Subramanya, is the other son of Lord Shiva and Parvati. Um, Ganesh being the first son, another or the, or the other son is Kartikeya. And in the Skanda Purana, it's said, uh, Lord Shiva says to Kartikeya, my dear son, the result one achieves by ba daily bathing in the, in the holy river Ganges for 300 kalpas. A kalpa is a very long period of time. We won't exactly, we don't need to go into exactly how long a kalpa is, but it's very long. So for 300 kalpas, uh, can it once be achieved by uttering Narayana even once? Now let's see, it says here, Sakrin. Sakrin means Sakrit, word Sakrit means at once or once, or it means just once, right? We remember the Ramacharma Sloka from the, uh, from the Ramayana, Sakrideva Prapannaya Tavasmiti Chayachite Abhayam Sarabhute Bhyo Dadam Yetad Vatam Mama. 
Okay, so Lord Rama says, even if you just say, I'm, I surrender to you, I'm yours, O Rama, just once. If you just say that once, I'll save you, right? Um, so here it said, <laughs> Sakrin, the same word, Sakrit, Sakrin. Uh, it means just once, Narayana, just once by Uktva. Uktva means by uh, speaking, just once by speaking the word Narayana, the name Narayana, the holy name. So what it basically means is the holy name of the Lord. Um, the Lord has hundreds and thousands of holy names. So Lord Chaitanya says in his Shikshastika, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda. Bahuda means there's many. Bahuda, Nam Nam. These names, there are many. Bahuda. Nam Nam Akari Bahuda, Nija Sharva Shaktis. And in each one of these names, there's the potency, unlimited potency. Unlimited potency. We were just discussing this the other day that Draupadi, when she was being, when she was having her sari, uh, uh, pulled and uh, they were trying to uh, disrobe her in the assembly when the Pandavas had lost the chess, the, the gambling match, and they had lost her in the gambling match. And the 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 winners had the uh, Dushasan, these people were trying to disrobe her in the assembly. She prayed, but Lord Krishna was in Dwarka, he was in Dwarka at that time, so he couldn't personally, he didn't personally come and save her, but his holy name was there, and his holy name saved her. So she, she, she prayed to Govinda and Govinda's name, the name of Govinda saved her. So it's very nice. So here, just, a, just one, one chanting of Narayana or any holy name of the Lord, right, is equal, is, we can't say it's even equal. It's, it's greater. It's greater than daily bathing in the Ganges for 300 kalpas. Nice. Oh, say so. Continuing on, a lot of Hari Bhakti Vidasas like this. They, these are what we call Mahatyam slokas. They sound like hyperbole. They uh, they sound like uh, the the idea is to explain to the person who's reading to give them an idea of the greatness of the holy name or the greatness of whatever is being extolled. So um, we can't actually place a value on the holy name. The holy name is is um, priceless you know we can't we can't actually put a put a, a definition on it and say it's it's actually equal to bathing in the ganges 300 for 300 kalpas it's actually greater than that it's it's supremely great so therefore um when when we hear these uh explanations we have to realize the idea is that the persons who are, who are giving us these in the shastras they are trying to encourage us they're trying to encourage us to to chant and to hear and to remember the holy names of the Lord. Good. So uh, continuing on with, uh, it says elsewhere, it doesn't say exactly where this quote is coming from. Uh, maybe we could find it sometime if we look in the, maybe the commentary it mentions it, but in the, in the text of Harivak Devas, it doesn't say where text 35 is coming from, but it just says elsewhere. So some, some other scripture says that, all sinful, re all sinful reactions of a person who chants the holy name of the Lord, of Lord Madhusudana, Madhusudana means the cure of the Madhu demon, who was a demon, as soon as he rises from bed in the morning are immediately nullified. Okay, so whenever we chant the holy name of the Lord, our sins are going to be nullified. But at the same time, here especially, it's recommending that when we, when we get up from sleep, we should immediately chant the name of the Lord. Continuing on, uh, text 36, because glorification of the Supreme Lord is the principal subject of this book. So here, Gopal Bhatta, he's, he's explaining what is, the, what is the, principal, the principal idea behind this book, right? Lekya Mukyam. Lekya means what I've written. Mukya means the primary, the primary thing, right? The primary thing. So the primary thing is the glorification of the Supreme Lord. Uh, uh, it will be described in a separate, separate section later on. So he doesn't want to get um, too, too far off the, the track. What are we talking about now? We're talking about uh, good behavior and we're talking about getting up in Brahma Mahurta and the activities that we should do every day. These are called Nitya Karmas, uh, eternal or daily activities. Remember, we talked yesterday about three types of activities, Nitya, Naimitika, and Kamya. So there are Daily activities, there are daily duties, we can say. Daily duties, occasional duties, right? They come at certain, on certain dates. 
And there are also duties that we have if we desire, if there's some desire that we have, and we, I gave the example yesterday, Putra Kamishti Yaga, or a, a sacrifice where somebody wants to have, wants to beget progeny, wants, wants some children. Okay, so continuing on. Um, so he's, what he's saying here is later on, he'll devote some big section to the glorification of the Supreme Lord. And right here, he's just uh, giving an indication, a little bit of an indication in the third chapter, because he wants to get to these other things like taking bath and going and worshiping the deity. He wants to get to these other activities. So he's going to do that uh, in detail here, and he's going to leave the full uh, explanation or mahatmyam of glorification of the Lord's holy names and the and the and, and different pastimes and forms of the de of the Lord till later on. So now the glories of remembering the Lord are described. So he's going to give uh, here. He's going to give a mahatmyam or a glorification of remembering remembering the Lord. So later on, he'll talk about chanting some more. He'll talk about uh, hearing. He'll talk about different parts, other forms of Navada Bhakti. Here he wants to concentrate on uh, remembering the Lord. And remember, we said when we started this, we talked about good behavior, that after initiation, there should be good behavior. And I said the, foot, the ultimate rule and regulation, if you, if you can't remember all the different rules and regulations and the little rules that there are here, the main rule and regulation is to always remember Lord Krishna and never forget him. That's the basis of all rules and regulations. So here he's going to emphasize that. He's going to emphasize remembering the Lord. So remembering the Lord is an eternal function, text 37. In the Padma Purana, there's also in the Padma Purana a thousand names of Krishna or a thousand names of Vishnu, which is, and this is actually, this is actually what I'm talking about right now. The 30, text 37 is that the, it explains that from there, the quote from, from Padma Purana from the Brihad Sahasra. Brihad means great, the great, uh, the, the great prayer of the thousand names of Vishnu. It says, Smartavya Satatam Vishnu Vishmartavya Najatu Chit Sarve Vidhi. Sarve Vidhi means all rules. Nishedaha. So vidi means what you should do, and nisheda means what you shouldn't do. Different types of rules. We said, yesterday we called them yama and niyama. So yama is a rule that says you should do this. And niyama is a rule that says you shouldn't do this, right? So sarve vidi, nisheda sure. So out of all do's and don'ts, out of all do's and don'ts, the most important one is to always remember Lord Vishnu and never forget him. So, uh, the, 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 this is being translated here. The person says Krishna is the origin of Lord Vishnu. That actually doesn't appear in the in the uh, in the text here. But anyway, we'll read it the way he wrote it. Krishna is the origin yeah, of Lord Vishnu. Uh, interpolation. Uh, it's I don't see it in the Sanskrit. So yeah. anyway, that's fine. That's fine. Krishna is the origin of Lord Vishnu. He should always be remembered and never forgotten at any time. All the rules and, and prohibitions, see the rules and the prohibitions mentioned in the Shastra should be the servants of these two principles. Okay, so this is the main principle. This, this verse is also quoted, I believe, by Madhvachari in his book. He has all the different Acharyas of different Sampradayas. They have books that they have written where they've taken, like Haribhakti Vilas, different quotes from different Shastras, and they've made books for their, their followers, their disciples, their students on you know, giving them the details of, of, a, of, a, of a, making it simple for them, because there's so many, there's so many prayers in the scriptures, and there's so many different rules and regulations. So each acharya of different sampradayas, they'll, they'll, they'll make a summary of the ones they think are more important for their students, for their followers. So here, Madhvacharya also quotes this, this verse too. It's a very famous verse. Smartavya Satatam Vishnu, very famous. So all rules and regulations, always remember Lord Krishna, never forget him. That's the essence of all rules and regulations. Very good. So probably I would say this is probably the, one of the most important verses here in this third chapter. So continuing on. In the Kartika Prasanga of the Skanda Purana, so there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a section in the Skanda Purana where Agastya Muni explains about 
more about Kartika, about the, the month of Kartika, which comes in October, November. And uh, Agassi Muni says in there, he says, every moment that is not used for thinking of Lord Vasudeva. Vasudeva means Krishna, son of Vasudeva. So uh, it also means va Paravasudeva of the Pancharatra system. It means Krishna. So it is considered to be a loss, foolishness, a fault, laziness, and blindness. So, so this is very clear that a lot of times when you hear um, these Mahatmyams or glorifications of a particular thing, here we're glorifying remembrance of Lord Krishna. So there's two ways to glorify in the scriptures. There's two ways that they use to glorify something. So here, we've, we've, first of all, usually what they do is they make a positive glorification by saying, as we saw, oh, remembering the Lord is like is, is greater than bathing the Ganges for 300 culprits. So we just saw that verse. Here it's saying, if you don't, so first of all, I'll tell you in positive terms, if you do remember the Lord, it's great. It's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's like 300 kalpas of bathing in the Ganges. Then, then secondly, what they do is they give, you they give you a negative. If you don't remember the Lord, what happens? It's considered to be a loss. Even one second, even one moment of not thinking of the Lord is considered to be a great loss. Foolishness. A fault, a mistake, laziness, blindness. It's considered so bad just to remember, to not remember the Lord for even one moment. It's really, it's a powerful statement being made here. So really the whole point, the whole point of, uh, of Hari Bhakti Vilas is what Gopalbhata is saying is to always remember the Lord. So, uh, so I, I find that very, that's a, great, that's a great statement. Okay, so then continuing on, uh, text 39. Uh, in the story of Dhruva, which is found in the uh, Kashi Kanda of some other, maybe from maybe from the same Skanda Purana, I'm not sure. We'd have to look that up. But anyway, there's a Kashi Kanda. Kanda means like a section or a canto. And uh, uh, Kashi is, of course, Benares or Allahabad, the place where the Ganges and the Yamuna come together. And there's actually a Trivania Saraswati River also, which comes there. So it's, uh, it's a meeting of three holy rivers. So Kashi is also considered to be a very holy place in, in the Puranas and people who die in Kashi. A lot of people in India, they, they, they think it's a good idea to go to Benares and to Kashi and to pass away in Kashi because they say that Lord Shiva, who's a great Vaishnava, will come when you die in Kashi and he will chant the Ram Taraka Mantra, which is Sri Rama, Jaya Rama, Jaya Jaya Rama in your ear at the time of death and you'll attain liberation that way. So that's, you know, that's, uh, there's many glorifications of passing away in Benares. Personally, uh, you know, I don't find Benares to be, um, you know, it's, it's it, that for a Vaishnava to go to Benares, there's also a lot of Advaitins, there's also a lot of Smarts there. And uh, to specifically, you know, if, you, if I were to say, what is the general mood in Benares? It's worship of Lord Shiva and not of Lord Vishnu. So just like anybody who's been to Vrindavan, Krishna is everywhere. In Benares, Shiva is everywhere. It's all Shiva and Ganga, basically Shiva and Ganga. So it's not my favorite holy place, but still it's considered a great holy place uh, for many reasons. The, the one reason of dying there and, and attaining liberation by hearing the, the mantra of Lord Rama, that's nice. So here in the story of Dhruva, Dhruva of course was uh, a king, a young prince, who uh, felt that he was being cut out of his um, inheritance, that he wasn't going to be made king. Uh, and so he wanted to be king. And so he went to the forest on the advice of his mother to, to, to meet the rishis who were in the forest. And he met Narada Muni and Narada Muni initiated him and told him to chant uh, a mantra, Narayana mantra, and he chanted it. And, and so this is a story of Dhruva, which everybody's pretty familiar with. So the whole idea is that Dhruva remembered Lord Vishnu. He remembered Lord Krishna all the time. And he, he attained perfection by meditating and chanting, chanting of his mantra, which he received in initiation. So this is applicable here because in, in Vilas 2, we were talking about Vaishnava initiation. And now in Vilas 3, we're talking here about Dhruva. Dhruva was initiated, and then after he was initiated, he meditated, he remembered the Lord. 
by chanting the mantra. So it says uh, in verse 39, not remembering Lord Vishnu is a great harm, a discrepancy and a symptom of misfortune. So again, uh, reiterating what was given in the last verse. Right? Text 40. Any second, minute or hour that is spent without the remembrance of Lord Vishnu is a time when one is being deceived by Yamaraj. That's interesting. Uh, I don't know. I, I never actually thought that you were being deceived by Yamaraj. I thought he was just simply judging you and you had, you had a responsibility to, to be good or to be bad. And uh, he would punish you accordingly. But here, here it seems to be saying that you, you're, you know, I know it's saying basically if you forget, if you forget Lord Krishna, even for a second, that uh, you're being deceived by the, the god of, uh, of rules, the god of death, Yamaraj. Okay, so continuing on, although remembering Lord Vishnu is an eternal function, learned personalities have described its glories in Shastra, along with those, uh, those of Darsha, Punamasha, and Agnihotra, okay, because it awards all kinds of results. Okay, so what they're saying basically here is the remembrance of the Lord is put in the same category as these other things, Darsha, Punamasha, and Agnihotra. So for those of you who don't know, there are different types of yagas or different types of homas, different types of ceremonies, fire ceremonies, right? And uh, there are actually 40 samskaras which are supposed to be performed in the life of uh, the twice-born persons. We were, yesterday, we were also talking about the Vanashram system. In the beginning of um, the third vilas, this, this chapter, right, it spoke about worshipping uh, Lord Vishnu. And the only way to do that is to basically follow the Vanashrama system. And we spoke a little bit about the Vanashrama system yesterday and how it can be understood in slightly different ways. Uh, if we look at it very technically and look at it uh, as the, the detailed rules that came in the medieval Smritis, then it may seem to be sort of an archaic um, social system, which is not practiced anymore, even in India. If it was ever practiced fully in India, we don't know. So. But uh, it has some good principles. There are some good principles in it, which come from, uh, which can be accepted, which come from the Upanishads and the Vedas. And originally the Vanashram system, of course, is based upon a verse in the Purusha Shukta, which is coming from the 90th uh, mandala. Sorry, excuse me, the 10th mandala. The 10th mandala, mandala is like a canto in the, in the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda has different cantos. So this uh, 10th canto, uh, 90th prayer, 90th uh, set of uh, uh, verses. It's a prayer. is called Purushukta. Purushukta means the hymn of man. It means the universal man. It, it means God, the, the word Purusha. So in that, there is a, there's a verse. Brahmano Syamo Kamasi, Bahu Rajan Yakutaha, Uru Tarashyad Vaishaha, Padyam Sudro Ajayata. Okay. So in that verse, it says that the Brahmins or the intellectuals, Right, the priestly class are were his head. Were the, they're the head. if you think of society as a as a person, as a as a human being, the head of that person would be the head of that social person, that person that represents society. The head of society are the intellectuals, the priestly class. Uh, so Brahmanosya Makamasi, Bahu Rajanyakritaha, the the arms which protect society. Right, the military, the, polit the political administrative people, right? Those people are the the arms of the social body. So, so we understand what the head of the social body is, the arms of the social body. Then we have Uru Tarasyad Vaishaha, Uru Tarasyad Vaishaha, the Uru, right, or the or the, the stomach, right? Uh, the stomach which nourishes the society, the the people who who create wealth, the people who create food, who create, um, who do business, the entrepreneurs, the, 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 the mercantile community, those people, the Vaishas, those people are the stomach of the, of the social body and Padbyam Sudra Jayata, the feet or the legs, which help to move the whole society along. The whole society is moved by the workers. Without workers, society doesn't go anywhere. Okay, so it has to go. So if it has to go, it needs, it needs to be workers. So these are the four 
classifications of four types of people in the Varnashrama system. These are called Varnas, or some people call them castes. We prefer to call them classes because uh, caste tends to indicate that they are, they are divided up according to birth, but we don't accept that because, as I said, I think yesterday, the Vrajasutrika Upanishad, which is a higher um, philosophical pramana, a higher uh, 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 scriptural proof than, uh, than Shmiti Shastras like Manu and Yajnavalkya and uh, etc. right? That uh, Vajrasutra Upanishad explains and, and some other things too, uh, some other stories in the, in the Upanishads explain like the Satyakama Jabala story, which I told in the last class, um, explain that caste or class in society, these classes are not um, designated because of birth, but they are because of qualities. Okay. So anyway, that is a long, a long, a long-winded explanation that we were talking about Van Ashram. But part of Van Ashram is these forty samskaras, which people who belong to the class of Brahmins, Chatriyas, and Vaishyas, the three upper classes, right? So who are the intellectuals, the administrators, and the mercantile, the business community? These people should perform these different samskaras. Samskaras are they are ceremonies which impress upon us. They make an impression upon us and they help us to integrate into society and they also purify us. So, so there are these 40 samskaras of which uh, today most people have only heard about 16, but there are actually 40. So even though, even though people have heard about 16 today, they practice maybe one or two of them in India. People at the marriage and the, and the funeral, okay, people practice the upanayanam, the, the thread giving ceremony, okay. May, and that's basically it. And some, a few uh, prenatal and postnatal samskaras are, are still performed by people who are very orthodox in, in India. Apart from that, they're not much practice. Okay, so what to speak of these other, uh, these other uh, 24, there's, 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 there's 24 more. And they are, there are three times eight, right? They're divided up into three classes. And and they, they involve a lot of doing of fire sacrifices. So here it's mentioned Darsha, Punamasya, and Agnihotra. Agnihotra is a Vedic fire sacrifice that everybody has to do. All the three upper classes have to do uh, every day, morning and evening. At sunrise and sunset, there's a, a, a specific uh, offering into the fire that the, that the Brahmin structures and Vaishyas have to do. And that's called Agnihotra. That is, that is a Vedic fire as distinguished from a uh, smarter fire or a non-Vedic Ashmiti fire, right? So there's also, there's also a daily fire that they have to, they're supposed to do, which is not a Vedic fire, but is another type of fire sacrifice. So this is Vedic fire sacrifices we're talking about here, something which is very, very orthodox. Darsha, Purnamasya, and Agnihotra. So Agnihotra is every day. The Dasha and the Purnamasya. Purnamasya obviously uh, has to do with Purnima. It had, it, these are full moon sacrifices, full moon sacrifices. The Dasha sacrifice is also at another time of the month. It's not every day. So these, these are Vedic sacrifices. They're Shruti Yagas, which are not performed hardly at all, any, at all uh, by anybody anymore. But they're very, very important to the people who follow, the people who are Orthodox and follow Vedic ceremonies. So... The point here, what is the point of, of, my, of my digression here? The point is that Gopal Bhatta is quoting a, a sloka here, which says that, the, that the, the eternal function of remembering the glories of the different uh, forms and names and pastimes of Lord Krishna are put in the same category as these very, very, very important Vedic sacrifices. So it's an incredible praise of the of the remembrance of the Lord, remembrance of Lord Krishna, that it's put in the same category as these these um, very important Vedic sacrifices, although they're not performed anymore. It's a it's a testimony to the greatness of the of remembering the Lord that people do still. Everybody still tries to remember Lord Krishna and never forget him, whereas they don't always. Nobody, hardly anybody, is doing these Vedic sacrifices. And yet these were considered very, very important Vedic sacrifices, but nobody does them anymore. So therefore we understand that Lord Krishna's name, remembering Lord Krishna and his name and pastimes and forms is much greater. 
greater than the Vedic sacrifices. So that's the point. So here we have again, atar, the word atar means now, now we're going to have a section called Smarana Mahatmya. Mahatmya means glorification or the glories. So the glories of remembrance of the Lord, the glories of remembering the Lord. It is more beneficial than bathing in all holy places. So this is just an aside that he's, that he's put there. And remember, we had that verse also just before. Sometimes things come, they don't, they're not always precisely in a, a specific section. In Haribak Dallas, you'll find glorifications of things here and there. But when you actually get a section in Haribak Dallas that says it's a Mahatmyam, there will be several or many, many slokas explaining the glories of a particular, one particular thing before Gopabhadi goes on to the next thing. Now, normally, normally the way the Hari Bhakti Vilas is written is that he explains certain things. He explains things simply and he explains things then in detail and gives, um, and gives many different rules and different things like that. And then at the end, he gives a glorification of the thing that he just explained. So we may, maybe we're not, maybe we're going to go into another section when we get to a section that says Mahatmyam. It means that after this, we're probably going to start a new section about some other topic rather than the remembrance of the Lord. Another way that he also writes is he gives things very, in a very complex way and then makes them more simple and then gives the Mahatmyam. So we look out for these different uh, writing styles in Hari Bhakti Vilas and how he presents different topics. So here he's giving the Mahatmyam of Smarna of Krishna Smarana, remembering Lord Krishna, which is of course one of the Navada Bhaktis, Travanam Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam, Vishnu Smaranam, remembering Lord Krishna. So uh, let's get to these. This is uh, verses 22 to 24, 42 to 44, excuse me. The smartest have said, the smartest have said, there are seven kinds of holy baths. Okay, so where's he gonna go with this? It's interesting, right? There are seven kinds of holy baths. So we're talking about getting up in the morning. So naturally, the subject of bath is going to come up, right? Because what do we do when we get up? Every time we get up, we go and we take a bath, right? Before we, because we have to do so many duties, and those eternal duties that come every day require us to not only have a pure body, but also to have a pure mind and a pure intelligence. So the smartest, what does he mean by smartest? When we see the word smarter, sometimes people in English get confused and they think that means the person is more intelligent than another person. No, smartas are people who simply follow Shmiti. The Shmiti Shastras, as I said, deal with the Vanashram system and they give many, many rules and regulations for the Vanashram system, right? So smartas are people who, who follow the, uh, uh, when we say somebody's a smarter, actually we're all smartas because everybody, in a sense, because everybody, um, all of us, all of us do accept the, the Shmiti Shastras as being scriptures, as being proper scriptures. We just don't follow every single little rule in the Shmiti Shastras. Vaishnavas don't normally follow every single little rule in the, script, in the Shmiti Shastras. But smartest people who normally smartest, when we say smartest, we're talking about Advaitins, people who are, in other words, Mayavadis or monists, those people uh, who are just regular Hindus, they believe um in following to the letter of the law they believe in following the smritis there are some people like that even today in india okay so vaishnavas are not usually like that because there are some exceptions to the rules in the in the smritis that go against what vaishnavas believe so we don't follow those things but in general the smritis are good books telling people how to live their lives in society especially Ivanashram society so the smarters who follow smriti more more closely. When he says smartest here, he doesn't mean all of us. He means those people who more, more, uh, who more emphasize the Shmiti rather than the Vaishnava Shastras. Vaishnava Shastras would be the Agamas, the Tantras, the Pancharatra Agamas, and, uh, and other books by Vaishnava Charis. The, sh the Shmitis are general for general Hindus, right? So the smartest who emphasize those books over the Vaishnava Agamas, right? They generally say that there are seven kinds of holy baths, right? We're getting up in the morning. We should take bath, but what type of bath should we take? If there's seven types of baths, what type should we take? So he's going to list them here. The mantra bath is the first one. A bath using mantras, chanting mantras. 
Partiva Bath. The Partiva Bath means using earth, Prithvi. Partiva means using Prithvi. Prithvi means earth. So what does that mean? It means you go to the river or you go to a place to bathe. You pull water from a well. You know, the use, the use of water is there in the Partiva Bath, right? Uh, the Partiva Bath. But you also use dirt. In those days, they would use dirt as an abrasive to rub off the sweat and all the all the dirtiness that is that is collected on the body um, during the night or or at any time when you take a bath. When you're going to take a bath, you're going to use some. You know, we in modern times we use soap and things like that, but they would use they would use uh, dirt. And still today, if you go and take a ritual bath in India in the Ganges or someplace like that, you're actually supposed to. If you go to a temple, especially if you go to a temple and they have a tank you know, a pond outside the temple, a, a holy pond. And before you go into the temple, you're supposed to take bath there. And many, many holy ponds and things like that, they, they, they don't allow you to use soap. So you have to go there and you have to take either some clay, you know, to, to rub off the dirt off your body uh, and then rinse, of course, or you have to just take bath with water like that. So that's the ritual bath. And, and anybody who's interested in understanding the actual system of ritual bathing, because it can be quite complex. It's not just it's not just go in and turn the shower on and wait yourself and get out. It's or there's a whole system to ritual bathing, and uh, if anybody's interested, we can go through that again. But anyway, the, so first is the mantra bath, chanting chanting's holy mantras and the names of the Lord. Second is Partiva bath, or with Prithvi, with earth. Third is Agneya bath. What is Agneya bath? Agni means fire. So when we do the fire ceremonies, either Vedic or, or, or uh, Pancharatric, Tantric, Agamic, or um, according to Shmitis, there are different types of fire sacrifices, we'll end up with what we call Basma. Basma means ash. The fire ceremony is not just an ordinary fire. It's not, it's not that the fire that that we do when we go to burn rubbish right when you burn rubbish or when you have a forest fire you also get ash at the end but that ash isn't pure the ash from a fire ceremony that's pure that's considered to be spiritually pure because it's the ash that comes from this um vedic ritual or or tantric ritual or or uh, shmiti ritual so agneya bath is to adorn the body just put some of that sacred ash on the body. And we see in India also, especially the followers of Lord Shiva, they like to use this ash, which is actually made from cow dung. They get cow dung and they, uh, there's a whole ceremony of making the special ash for vibhuti, what they call vibhuti, um, uh, so that they can wear the three-lined um, horizontal tilak of Lord Shiva. So the vibhuti, or sometimes people just put a dot of, of vibhuti on, like that. So Agneya bath is taking some sacred ash and touching it to the body. So the idea is in, in, uh, in Hinduism and in Vaishnavism in general, there's an idea of purity and contamination. There's purity and contamination. There's ritual purity and ritual contamination. There's actual purity or physical purity and physical contamination. For instance, if somebody dies in your family, you doesn't make you physically impure, but it makes it may make you mentally impure because you're 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 mourning, you're in mourning. So so uh, th there are this a type of impurity that attaches to you, but it's not physical. So uh, similarly, there might be some ritual, uh, some rule in the in the scriptures that says you're ritually impure at a certain time, or by doing a certain activity, or by not doing a certain activity. So there's ritual purity and there's physical purity. There's ritual contamination and spirit and uh, physical contamination. So what, how does contamination occur? Usually contamination occurs because of contact between something which is contaminated and something which is uncontaminated. Now, in some cases, in some cases, when the, un, when the contaminated thing touches the uncontaminated thing, the contaminated thing becomes purified, right? In other, in other cases, when the, the, the uncontaminated thing touches a contaminated thing, the contaminated thing 
lends contamination to the uncontaminated thing. So you have a pure thing which becomes impure, like if you have a glass of milk and you add ink to it, it becomes contaminated, right? You wouldn't want to drink milk that has ink in it. So just giving an example. In other, but you might have a dirty piece of iron. If you put it in a fire and heat it up, then all the, the dirt will come off and the, and the pure iron will remain because it'll be burned off, right? So there's some cases where contamination, uh, but in e either case, in either case, contamination and purity are lent by contact between two things. So here we have, First, the mantra bath, by, by, by chanting the holy name, by chanting the holy prayers like that, we become purified. We're impure, and by contact with the holy name, we become pure. Second thing, the, the partiva bath with the, with the earth, by contact with the earth, by chanting, the mritika shukta, or the earth shukta, the dirt shukta, uh, and then touching the body with that, that sacred dirt that's been purified with the mantras and taking a, a, a water bath and washing that off, we become pure. With the agnaya, taking the basma or the ash and touching it to the body, again, there'll be some mantras to chant, but still, it's the, the, the ash itself is considered pure and therefore the touch of the pure thing makes us pure. So first, the touch of the pure holy names makes us pure. The touch of the pure earth makes us pure. The touch of the pure um, ash makes us pure. Vayavya. Vayavya. Vayava means vayu. Vayu. Vaya means air. So, so sometimes we say, okay, uh, my cloth, I wash my, my, my clothes are dirty. So I wash my clothes. After I wash my clothes, I put them on a line. And, uh, and hang them out in the sun. And the sun and the wind, right, purify them. So the wind is also a purifier. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, a purifier is I'm the wind. So vayavya means taking a bath by standing in the wind, by having the air purify you or purify something, right? Vayavya. We can remember back to the process of purification that we talked about Soshana Dahana Plavana. I'm not sure whether we talked about that yet here. Soshana Dahana Plavana. Here we have Agnaya, Agni. Agni is a purifier. Earth is a purifier. No, earth is a purifier. Fire is a purifier. Air is a purifier. Water is a purifier. These are all purifiers. So, so um, when, we, when we purify some, some uh, when we purify some uh, some element that we're using in a ritual like that, sometimes we do what's called soshana dahana plavana. Soshana, uh, soshana with the with the with the yam bij, which is the vayu bij. There's a bija mantra for for vayu or for air. We write it on the palm of the hand and we show the palm of the hand over that in a clockwise manner. So we say om yam vayu bij namaha soshayami. Then with that and we're meditating when we do that that we're that we're drying something up. We're drying something up. So sometimes drying things up purifies them. Think about, it again, cow dung. The cow dung is wet, and then we dry it up, and we make it into little cakes, and then we can keep it, you know, for doing the fire sacrifice like that. So sometimes drying up, drying up is, is purifying. So yam soshe yam, so, yam vai vena maha soshe yam is the first thing that we do. Then we chant Ram, Ram Agni Namaha. Ram is the, is the Bija mantra for fire. Ram Agni Namaha, Dahayami, we burn things with Ram, with Agni. That also is purifying. And the, and the third thing is Vam. Vam is Varuna Bij. Varuna is the god of waters, right? So with water also we purify, we nectarize something. Yam, so, so we write Vam, Vam, uh, Om. Vam Amritaya Namaha, Plavayami. I nectarize with the Vam Bij, the Varuna Bij. So here we're, we're talking about those things. So we have Vayava, Vayavya, uh, Vayavya, which is by the air, Divya, Divishnanam. Now, Divya, the, 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 the Divya bath is a bath that somebody would take if you went out into 
uh, into the rain, but at the same time as it's raining, it's also the sun is shining at the same time. So rain and sun at the same, at the same time. Very common occurrence here in Hawaii. It's called Divyashnanam or the divine bath. Varuna bath is a bath in water. So if you just, like I said, if you just, if you don't have that earth to do the, to do the ritual bath, you also just use water. That's called Varuna, Varuna bath. And then Manasa bath. Manasa bath means simply meditation on the personality of Godhead. If you meditate upon the Lord, that meditation purifies you, right? Without even chanting of the Lord's name. Meditation either on the Lord's name or meditation on his form or his pastimes. Any of these meditations, which are all considered purifying, are considered above. So it's going to explain these different ones here. So there are these seven, right? What are they again? Mantra, Partiva, Agneya, Vayavya, Divya, Varuna, and Manasa. Okay? And then we explain them. Chanting of the mantra, Sanna Apaha. So there's a Vedic mantra that goes, it starts out. A lot of times in the scriptures, you will see the mention of only the first part of the mantra. But because everybody knows this mantra, because the Brahmins are all who are reading these scriptures, that's another thing that we have to understand that when the author writes Hari Bhakti Vilas, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, he expects his audience to be intelligent people who know all these things. They, the people who are reading this in Sanskrit, they have gone to the Gurukula. They have studied under the, the, under the tutorship of a, of a guru. And that guru has explained to them all these things. And they've learned all these things already. So they know when, when they've, they've studied the Vedas. And therefore, they know this Sanna Apaha. So we can look up this, this mantra, Sanna Apaha. I, there are some. Now, uh, the type, the, the specific branches of the Vedas, which are, which are, which are uh, followed, in Vrindavan, mostly, are Shukli Yajurvedas, right? So this is a mantra from Shukli Yajurveda, which I don't know the full mantra or anything like that. But in the Krishna Yajurveda, there's a similar mantra for mantra math, which we chant in Sanjay Vandana every day. So that is the same mantras, same similar type of mantras which are used in, yeah, mentioned here. So we can look this up in the Vedic importance and we can find that mantra. And that is the mantra that he's explaining is to be chanted for mantra bath. So he says, chanting the mantra, sanna apaha, and the word apaha means water. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prayer about water, a prayer to water, right, to purify us, right? And it's considered to be the mantra bath. Touching clay is considered to be the partiva bath. So you get some clay, take it with you to the river or to the pond or, to, or next to the well. You, and you put some water on, you rub, you rub it on your body to get the dirt off, then you rinse with water again. That's called the Partiva bath. Smearing one's body with the ashes that are called, uh, is called the holy ashes, not just any ashes, holy ashes, it's called Agneya bath. Smearing one's, one's body with the dust of the cow hooves, right? The sacred animal is the cow, and uh, Lord Krishna was very fond of cows. He was a cowherd boy. And the dust that comes up from the hooves of calves or cows is considered pure, purifying, and therefore that is called the vayavya bath. The, the point here is that the dust is being blown in the wind, right? So it's not just the, the, the dust, but it's also the wind. That's why it's called vayavya, because vaya means fire. Vaya. Okay, so there's a specific time in the morning and the evening called go duli mohurta. Go duli mohurta. So there's a mohurta, a time of day, which is which has got to do with go duli. Go means cows, duli means dust. So go duli mohurta is when the cows go out to pasture and when they come back from pasture, they kick up dust. So if you're in Vrindavan, you'll see that that time of day in the morning and the evening, there'll be a little dust in the air. That is purifying because it's it's the type of bath. It's the vayavya bath. Taking a bath in the rain when there's sunshine is called divya bath, which I already explained. So if, it's, if you're out there in a sun shower or what we call a, you know, a, a, a divya shnanam, that is a divine bath when the sun is shining and the rain is slightly coming at the same time. So taking a bath in a river or pond is called varuna bath. 
from any body of water and the water should be pure, right? So why do we say taking bath from a river or a pond? Why don't we say just turning on the tap, right? Because the tap water is impure. The water that comes through the tap is impure. The water that comes out of the shower is impure. Any water that is held in a tank, in a, in a, in a tank is impure. Even the water, even rainwater, which is not, when the sun is shining, is not considered to be pure, okay? So water, in order to be pure, it should also be connected with something that is pure. The earth is pure. The earth is Bhudevi, Bhumi Devi, the goddess of the earth, is the consort of the Supreme Lord Vishnu. So water that is kept in a well in the earth, in a pond in the earth, in a river in the earth, even in an ocean on the earth, that water is pure because of its contact with the earth, the goddess of the earth. Water which is taken out of those things and kept somewhere else becomes ritually impure. So here's again what I said about being ritually pure and ritually impure, right? So we take, we may use a shower, we may go and, 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 the, and the water comes out of a pipe, it's kept in a tank, you know, like that. It's not ritually pure water. It's not considered ritually pure. So you could take a bath like that, go to the bathroom, turn the tap on, take a shower. That's not considered a ritually pure bath. Sorry to tell you. Okay. If you want a ritually pure bath, I mean, not one of these other baths, but a ritually pure water bath, a ritually pure water bath, not, a, not an ash bath or, or a dirt bath or a mantra bath or a, if you want to perform a, right, a, uh, a varuna bath, a ritually pure water bath, it has to be in a pond, in the sea, in a, in a tank, in the ground, or a river. Some, some connection to the, to the earth has to be there like that to make it pure like that. Or you can take a, 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 pure, a pure pot, you know, and you can put it into a well. The well, is all, well water is also pure, but you have to pull the water out with a pure implement, right? So that is, that is the Varuna bath, right? So there are people who, there are still some very, very orthodox people in India. They won't take bath from a pipe. If any of those, anybody who's, uh, who's uh, been uh, watching our um, classes with Dr. Alwa in Mysore, his parent, his father, uh, Lakshmi Tadachar in Malkot still at the age of whatever it is of 70s and 80s like that he still will not drink from a pipe will not bathe from a pipe from a tank only by pulling from a well or by dipping in dipping into a, uh, a river or a pond which is in the earth like that those people there are many there are some people not many let's say these days who still consider that is the only way to bathe and that is and factually speaking and then then there are other people who for instance they they have a bathroom in their house they have a tank they have they do take like that they do take bath in that way but on special occasions when they want to be more ritually pure they will go to a outside to an outside tank or to a river and they'll take bath in the river so that's also quite common that orthodox people today, even if they don't take bath that way every day, but on special occasions, they'll do that. So here we're explaining about these seven types of bath. Uh, so taking a bath in the river is called Varuna bath and taking a bath in one's mind by meditating upon Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna, that's considered a Manasa bath. Of all these baths, the Manasa bath, the mental bath is considered the best. It's the best. To think of Lord Krishna, to think of his form, his name, his pastimes, his mantra is the best. That's the most purifying. Right? So uh, that's a very interesting set of, uh, set of, 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 uh, of slokas there, of, of verses. And it's, uh, it gives us the glorification of actually remembering the Lord. So the whole point of this is not just to explain the seven different types of bath, but to explain that the manasa bath, Mentally thinking about Lord Krishna, right? His form, his name, his pastimes, his paraphernalia, his devotees. Any of these things is going to be the best type of bath. It's the best type of bath. So continuing on with uh, text 45 and 46. 
Here's a quote from Parasura Muni. Parasura Muni is the father of Veda Vyasa. And another quote down below from Manu, probably from Manu Shmiti. So these are Shmiti Shastras, right? Parasura wrote Parasura Shmiti and Manu wrote Manu Shmiti. So these are, these are different Shmiti Shastras which give rules and regulations for Vanashrama. So we're going to see what they say. Parasura Muni has said that if one's body is not healthy, then without depending upon time, place and person, one achieves the same results while performing all kinds of bath. Right. So basically what Parasara is saying, Parasara Rishi, the father of Vedavyas, it's the author of Vishnu Purana. All the Puranas are compiled by Vedavyasa, except for one, the, uh, the Vishnu Purana, which is compiled by his father. So Parasara and the author of Parasara Shmiti also. So Parasara, he says that we should, depending upon our health, right? If we're not healthy, then we should decide which bath to take. It's like maybe we, we don't have, maybe if we take a, normally people take a water bath every day or more than once a day, right? According to different uh, rules and regulations, one may have to bathe once a day, twice a day, thrice a day, whether one is a, uh, normally uh, we have sannyasis are supposed to, uh, in terms of different ashramas in the Van Ashram system, sannyasi is supposed to bathe three times a day, uh, a brahmachari once a day, grasta twice a day, right? Vanapasta, I'm not sure, but there are some rules like that. Um, more or less people are not following exactly that that system too much anymore unless you're the unless you're a, a jir swami of a mutt or something a head swami of a mutt in which, in which case you have lots of time to take three baths a day but but you know in today's world a lot of people are taking less than three baths a day but it's very orthodox also in india is a very hot place so in, in india at least parts of india are and that if you're in the himalayas maybe you're not taking three baths a day but in, uh, in many other places you're taking, um, taking, you can take three bars a day easily, quite easily in Sri Rangam, I'll tell you. It's quite easy to take three or more bars a day because it's hot. So what he's saying here in here is that sometimes taking a bath with water, uh, maybe if you're not healthy, you can't, you can't go and do that under doctor's orders. You probably shouldn't be taking bath because you might catch a cold or for whatever reason, okay? So in, in that case, right, you should consider according to time and place and circumstance, right, what, what of these seven types of baths you can take. But the best type of bath, remember, the Manasa bath, thinking about, the, about Lord Krishna, everybody can take that anytime. So that's, it's the best also from that point of view, right? So even if you're unhealthy, even if you're sick, you can still remember the Lord and purify yourself in that way. So then Manu says that by bathing in the mind, in other words, Manasa bath, right? Brahmin householders attain liberation. Well, that's nice, right? Uh, amongst all types of bath, the Manasa bath is the best. The Manasa bath is the best, right? Nice. So now continuing on about uh, more about remembering the Lord, text 47, remembering the Supreme Lord, is supremely purifying. In the Garuda Purana, in the in the Garuda Purana, Narada, and in the uh, in the Garuda Purana, uh, Vishnu Dharma and Pulas Pulastya Muni, Narada Muni and Pulastya Muni, in the Vishnu in the Vishnu Dharma have said both. Uh, oh, I see. So it, this is a quote from the Garuda Purana, but it's also, as I said before. And also from the Vishnu Dharma, this is very, um, this, is pro this verse is probably known to a lot of people. Apavitra pavitra va, sarva avashtam, katopi va, yasmarit kundri kaksham, sa bahya abhyantara suchihi. It's not vahya, it's bahya. Okay, so it means outward and inward. Suchihi means purified. You're purified within and without. Whether one is pure or impure, any condition of life, one is, uh, one, if one simply remembers this, the lotus eyed Supreme Lord, he is, he is at once, uh, becomes purified externally and internally. It's a very, very famous verse. So uh, sometimes this verse accompanies 
the act of Achramana. We discussed about Achramana a little bit yesterday that uh, when you get up, you're supposed to say Achramana and you're supposed to put on after washing your, your hands, mouth and feet, then you're supposed to say Achramana and then change your clothes and then say Achramana again. So Achramana has been described here, uh, but it hasn't actually been given in full. But this, uh, this, this sloka also accompanies Achramana sometimes. And sometimes people use it for sprinkling water on, on, on things or on themselves to purify themselves. It's a very common, common prayer. Okay. Text 48. Uh, even if one is contaminated by unlimited sins, <clears throat> if he remembers Lord Vishnu, he becomes purified both internally and externally. Nice. So you can see these two verses go together. That the last line in each, in each show, uh, the last line in each verse is sa bhaya bhyantara Nice. Uh, so I'm not quite sure here if the first one comes from Guru Dharma and the second one comes from Vishnu Dharma or whether we could look that up. I do know the first one is definitely in Guru Purana, Guru Purana, but it may also be in the Vishnu Dharma. We would have to look up in the in those two scriptures to see if both of these prayers are in both those places, or if the first one is in Garuda Prana and the second one is coming from Vishnu Dharma. Okay. Uh, continuing on, text 49, it uproots all sinful reactions, thinking, me meditating upon the Lord. So from Vishnu Purana, again, by Parasa Rishi, right? It's stated, amongst all types of atonement, austerity, charity, Chanting of mantras and vows, the remembrance of Lord Krishna is the best. It's the best. Okay. So atonement means if you do something wrong, you have to atone for that. You have to do what's called prayastita in Sanskrit. Prayastita means an act which is done when you know that there's been some, or even if you don't know, sometimes there's a, there's a, uh, we do prayastita even if we don't know we've made a mistake, but we assume maybe we did some mistake. We do what's called prayastita. So atonement, austerity, charity, chanting of mantras and vows, the best is remembering Lord Krishna, the best. What exactly does it say here? Prayas, prayas titiyave asheshani, tapat, tapat karmat bhakani kani cha. Okay. Kani tesham asheshanam, Sri Krishna, Krishnanu smaranam param. Yeah, this is a very common, um, a common prayer which is chanted at the end of rituals, okay? In the fire ceremonies at the end of ritual pujas. This is what we call a uh, uh, chamashwarpana stotram. Stotram means a prayer. Chamashwarpana means for forgiveness, a prayer for forgiveness. So sometimes people say that. This, they chant this, praise uh, to It's a different, a little bit slightly different. Um, the, in, instead of, instead of chad, they put by, um, it's it's mentioned in some other some other places in a slightly different form, but it's the basically exactly the same, um, almost exactly the same words. Okay, so continuing on with text fifty, um, a person who repents after committing sinful activities, for a person like that, remembrance of Lord Hari is the best form of atonement. So again, the word price to is used here for atonement. Hari, some smarana. So not just smarana, but some smarana. So to give emphasis to uh, the word smarana, which means remembrance, they put this word some before it. Like, like there's kirtan, and then there's some kirtan, some kirtan. So there's smarana, and then there's some smarana. Hari, some smarana, param is the best. Param means the best. Okay. Continue on with text 51. Now it's also said, Simply by remembering Lord Hari even once, a person can immediately become free from the contamination of Kali Yuga, which awards one the pangs of hellish conditions. So Kali Yuga, the actual, the Yuga or the age that we're living in right now, is normally considered to be a pretty bad time. It's not the golden age. It's not the silver age. It's not the copper age. It's the iron age. It's the, the age of quarrel and discord where Three legs of Dharma are destroyed and only a little bit of truthfulness, if, if that, is still around, right? So there's no mercy, there's no austerity, there's no, there's no penance. It's a very, you know, full of bad qualities, Kali Yuga. It's a, it's a, it's a very bad time. So in, even in that bad time, 
simply remembering Lord Hari even once, even once, just remembering him even once can immediately free yourself from the contamination of this yuga of this time, right? So before, interesting, before we were, we were discussing about remembering the Lord always, right? We should try to remember the Lord always. But here it's saying, even if you just, and, and we're also saying about chanting the Lord's name once, chanting the Lord's name once, chanting the, uh, remembering the Lord just once can immediately free you from all contamination. So it's not that you have to remember him always to be freed from contamination. Immediately you remember him just once you're freed from all contamination. Of course, the goal is to always remember him. But even if you don't, even if you just remember him for one, for one second or one, one moment, you're freed from all contamination of Kali Yuga. That's great. So continuing on with text uh, 52, Komare means in the, kum, in the, kuma, the Kurma Purana. So there's a Kurma Purana, and the Supreme Lord in the Kurma Purana has said, the insurmountable sinful reactions of those who, who remember me, the Supreme Lord in this age of Kali and render devotional service unto me are immediately destroyed. So the Lord, he confirms it in the Kurma Purana. He says, you have got unlimited sins. You have got, we were talking about anadi karma, beginningless, anadi, right? Adi means beginning, beginning with. Uh, anadi means beginning less, beginning less sin. We have got sin from unlimited lifetimes right we can't even count the lifetimes we can't even we can't even imagine that the sins right we were we were reading in uh stotra Ratna the other day when acharya says what does he say he says every sin you can think of every sin in the scripture i've done in a previous life or in this life that's what he prays to the lord he says you know that in every in in, in all these lifetimes right whether this life or previous life, I have committed every single sin that is given in the scriptures. And even sins that are not even thought about in the scriptures I've committed. I have committed so many sins. I'm such a sinner, he says. But if I simply remember the Lord one time, right? All those sins get nullified. All those sins get nullified. The problem is, of course, that like an elephant who takes a bath, Right when the elephant comes out, he throws dirt on his back again. So the problem for us is not remembering the Lord once, but is remembering the Lord always. Because when we forget the Lord again, we commit some sinful uh, action. But it's good to know that remembering the Lord immediately destroys and nullifies all sins, and we should always take encouragement from that. At the same time, we can feel a little bit uh, depressed by the fact that yes, we remember the Lord, but next the next second we forget him and we we again commit some sin so that's that's bad we should try to avoid that but here we should take uh take heart in this uh in this discussion that that just by simply remembering the lord for a second we're going to be free from from the our sins are going to be nullified all the sins that come to us because we live in Kali Yuga. so continuing on with uh text 53 is a conversation between Shukra, Shukra means Shukracharya, who was the guru or teacher of Bali Maharaj. So the conversation between Shukra and Bali in the Brihad Naradiya Purana. So there's a Naradiya Purana, there's a Purana which is by Narada, which talks all about Narada, who's a great Rishi and a great guru. And uh, it's a big one, Brihad, it's a big Purana, it's a very lengthy one. In there, there's a conversation between Shukracharya and Maharaj Bali, and it says the following, Lord Hari takes away. The word Hari itself means one who takes away. What does he take away? He takes away our simple reactions. He takes away our material desires. He may, he may take away other things too. Maybe he takes away all our wealth. He maybe he takes away all our, our happiness, you know, like that. It's possible. But the word Hari itself means one who takes away. So here it's being saying, uh, Harir, Hariti. It's interesting. Harir means Hari, the Lord Hari. And Hariti means he takes away. Harir, Hariti. So you can see it's very, very, it's like alliteration here. The, the word is being explained. The word Hari is being explained by the use of the verb Hariti, Hariti, right? 
and Papani means sins, many sins. So Hari Hariti Papani, right? <laughs> so Lord Hari, it's great, it's nice. Lord Hari takes away the sinful reactions of even the most sinful people if they simply remember him. Just as fire burns a person, even if he touches it accidentally. We've all had this experience. You know, we know this. When, when you're a child, maybe you, you don't know about fire first thing, or you don't know the stove is hot in the kitchen, and you accidentally touch it. Hopefully your parents told you, you know, don't touch fire, don't touch the stove. It could be hot. And you accidentally touch it. It doesn't matter. Ignorance is no excuse, right? That you don't, I didn't know it was hot, but still you're going to be burned, right? So fire burns some, somebody, even if accidentally. So again, we can look at this uh, slogan from the Bhagavatam, Shrima Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, Sankatyam Parihasyamba, Stobam Helenamivava, Vaikundanama Grahanama Shesha Grahanam Vidu, right? The, the definition of the chanting of the holy name in different circumstances what we call namabasa, right? So there are different circumstances like joking or playing around or, or for entertainment. There's different ways that we could chant, right? They're not exactly totally pure, thinking about service of the Lord, but they're also not offensive, right? So uh, the sinful reactions of a person are, are burned away just simply by chanting the name, by remembering the Supreme Lord. Just by remembering him and by chanting the name, right? If I simply remember him, right? So the same thing with chanting the holy name. If I simply chant, you know, jokingly or, or playing around or for entertainment, if I use the word, you know, if I talk about the washa rama when I go to the laundromat, then I've spoken the name rama and somehow, somehow or other I get benefit from that. And it, and it burns me like fire. Even if, 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 even if I say it accidentally, even if I remember the Lord accidentally, right? So we have uh, in India, for instance, uh, people uh, understand this. And therefore, even though they're making some product, which has not got anything to do with spiritual life, like uh, they have these, uh, these mulberry leaf cigarettes called beedies in India. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, some people used to, Nowadays, they're not so popular, but they have mulberry leaf cigarettes that they make in India. They're called beedies, right? Beedies, little things. And uh, of course, smoking, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, a thing which normally, which, which holy people do or Vaishnavas do. It's, a, it's not considered to be, a, it's a dirty habit, basically, right? And it's a, some sort of addiction. Anyway, so this person, a person made a company and he calls it Sham Beedies. Sham Beedies. So on every, Every packet of these cigarettes, there's a picture of Krishna because Krishna is Sham, Shamasunda. So the people, when they buy the cigarettes, they see Krishna, right? Even though they're doing something sinful, uh, smoking cigarettes, something unhealthy for them, something contaminating and something very dirty, a dirty habit, right? But because they see Lord Krishna when they buy the cigarettes, you know, they become purified because they remember Krishna and they, and if they ask, for, if they ask for, can I have some sham beedies? They immediately say sham, which is the holy name. This is just an example that I give. In India, sometimes you'll see that, that many, many other things, uh, material products are advertised with uh, images of, of the Lord and the images of different uh, gods and goddesses. So people understand, people understand that, that the thing itself, if you associate it with another thing, it becomes it, it, at least some people are getting some benefit from uh, from from chanting the, the name Sham or thinking about Lord Krishna, even though they're, they're doing some something uh, which is not good for them and not not clean and impure and uh, addictive, you know, something which is against spiritual life. So anyway, the point is here the, that that is from the word uh, uh, accidentally. So the idea is that. That even if we remember Lord Krishna accidentally, even if we chant his name accidentally, we attain this purification. We, we nullify our sinful reaction. So com continuing to 50, uh, 54. Uh, in the same Purana, right, what we're talking about in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, the Brihad Naradiya Purana, there's a section, a prize to the section. There's a section about atonement. 
because there are different atonements. So you eat something which you shouldn't have eaten, a forbidden thing, then you fast for one day. Or if you, you did some other sin, then maybe you have to fast in a certain way for a whole month or you have to take a bath in a particular holy place. Or what, there are many, many different types of atonements. So there's a whole section in this Purana, in this big Purana, where Narada Muni is giving, explaining about different types of atonements. So even if uh, one is the most sinful person, if his mind is engaged at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu, uh, then he at once becomes liberated from all sinful uh, reactions. It's fantastic. Fantastic thing that 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 in a, in a section on price to, on doing atonements, the best atonement will be to just simply remember the Supreme Lord, to remember Krishna, never forget him. So, continuing on here, Brahma Vaivarta Purana, Brahma Vaivarta Purana, which has a lot of episodes about Lord Krishna and Radha and Krishna in it. It's a very interesting Purana. Um, it mentions all sinful reactions accumulated since time immemorial due to sinful activities committed by one's body, mind, or speech are eradicated simply by remembering the lotus feet of Krishna. So here it is this interesting. The interesting point in this verse is that it mentions sins not only committed externally, not, not just gross sins, physical sins, but it, meant, it, it, it mentions other types of sins, a sin in the mind and a sin in the speech, right? So we can blaspheme somebody or we can, we can say something which is sinful. We can think something which is sinful, right? Now, normally in, um, I believe, we can find this somewhere in Shastra like that, that mental sins and even even the sins of, of, of blasphemy. But, well, blasphemy is an external thing. So, uh, so I guess uh, sins, of, there are these different types of sins. So, so they are more subtle. From, there's the gross physical sins, then there's the sins of the speech, and then there's the sins of the minds. So we, can, we can hark back to the, the story of uh, Brigamuni. Brigamuni was, uh, a, a, was a rishi, he was a sage who was sent by other sages on a mission to check out uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva and to see which one of them was supreme uh, to test them in different ways. So he went, to, he went to Brahma and he committed a mental offense to Brahma by not offering his respects to him because he was the son of Brahma. Many of these uh, original rishis were sons of Brahma. So he didn't offer any obeisances to Brahma. He didn't bow down before him. He didn't offer any words of praise when he saw his father, Brahma. So, um, so Brahma got upset that there was this mental offense that he didn't, he didn't externally uh, show any reverence to Brahma, but it was more or less a, a mental snubbing of Brahma. And so Brahma became upset for that. So Rishi realized he's not supreme because he became, but this, is a, uh, this is a slight offense. A mental offense is considered to be less of an offense. If, it, if, it, if we think about sin in the, uh, over and over again, eventually it may manifest in a physical way. But, but uh, normally, if, it, if the sin is still just in the mind, it's considered to be a lesser offense. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so then the, 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 he, next he went to see Lord Shiva and he insulted him with words. He said, even though you are a son of Brahma, I'm a son of Brahma, because Shiva is a Manasikaputra of Brahma. So he's a mental son of Brahma. So he's also a son of Brahma. So they're like brothers, Brigu and Shiva. So he, usually when you meet a brother, you embrace them, you, you, you say something nice, how are you? You ask about their welfare. He did none of that. So he instead, he started to curse him out and say, look, you're so dirty all the time. You live in in crematoriums, you live, you, you live in these dirty places. So Shiva, you're, you know, I don't want to touch you, right? Because of that. So he was saying that. So this was a, a, a fence, offense of the, of the words. So he saw that Shiva became offended by that. In fact, Shiva was considering to, to uh, bring about the Pralaya and cause the destruction of the universe just because of that offense. 
anyway, he, he got calmed down after some time, but, but Brigu realized that uh, Shiva is also not supreme. Finally, he went to see Lord Vishnu. And so that is a greater offense. Mental offense, greater than a mental offense is a offense of the words, of the speech. And the third one, offense of the body, a physical offense, actually hitting somebody or chastising somebody physically, beating them. <coughs> That's, that is worse. So he went to Lord Vishnu. And when he saw Lord Vishnu, he went immediately up and kicked him in the chest, which is a physical offense. In fact, he kicked him in, in the place on the chest where the Sri Vatsa is on the right side of the chest where Lord, where uh, Goddess Lakshmi is always residing. So he, not a good thing to do. Anyway, so that, that was his, that was his offense. It was his corporal offense, his physical offense. So that was considered the worst. Lord Vishnu immediately uh, was not offended, was immediately asking about the welfare of the Rishi's foot. That, that, oh, you kicked me in the chest. I have a diamond hard like chest. You probably hurt your foot. So he was, Lord Vishnu wasn't upset at all. So therefore, from that story, Riga could understand that he is the, he is the greatest. Because even this greatest of offenses I, I did to him, physical offense, not just a mental offense or a, a offense of words, but a physical offense that I did to him. And he didn't, uh, he didn't get angry at all. So he, in, this, in this, it's explaining about these three different types of offenses. All of these offenses, right? The ones in the mind, the ones in the speech, and the ones in the by the body, they're all destroyed simply by remembering the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. So continuing on, um, text 56, uh, Parasar Muni says again in the, in the part of the Skanda Purana, which deals with the Kartik month, right? He gives this thing. He says, a person who remembers Sri, Sri Hari, who sits on the back of Garuda, will not have to meet the fearful Yamadutas, Right, a duta is a messenger, the messengers of Yama, the messengers of the god of death, who usually come to sinful people after they die, come to their souls, even while dreaming. And he will not have to tra traverse the, pain, the painful path of hell, the hell. Nice. So again, we can think back to the, the Bhagavatam, the story of Ajamil who was a little bit spiritual in his youth. And uh, later on, he left spirituality altogether and became a very sinful person. But he did have a son who he named Narayana after the Supreme Lord. And at the time of death, he was very much afraid and he called for his son. So in calling for his son, he chanted the name Narayana. So because he chanted the name Narayana, uh, he was considered sinless. And therefore, the Vishnu Dutas, the messengers of Vishnu, came to take him to Sri Vaikuntha to liberation. Uh, but the Yama Dutas, the messengers of Yamaraj, also came because he was a sinful person up until that point. So the Vishnu Dutas had to explain to the Yama Dutas, the, the servants of Vishnu had to explain to the servants of Yamaraj, that because this person, chanted the name Narayana, he has freed himself from all his sins. So you don't have any jurisdiction here anymore. You, 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 you are to take only sinful people. But this person isn't sinful. He may have been sinful before in his previous life, but because he simply chanted the name of Narayana, even though he didn't mean to, to call the Supreme Lord Narayana, but only to call his son, who he had called Narayana, still, He's free from all sins. <coughs> and therefore, therefore, you can't take him. So that's the point. The point here is that even while dreaming, if one remembers the Supreme Lord, 
Sri Hari, even while dreaming, right? Even unconsciously, if somehow or other we remember the Supreme Lord, we do not have to go to hell. <coughs> mm. So continuing on with uh, text 657 is from the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Purana. And again, this is the story of Ajamil in the sixth canto. Sixth canto, first chapter, 19th verse. Although not having fully realized Krishna, although not having fully realized Krishna, persons who have even once surrendered, again, we have this word here, sakrin. Sakrin means once only. Sakrin, once only. Manaha means mind. Krishna Padaravindayur, the lotus feet of Krishna, right? One who uh, once surrendered completely unto the lot uh, unto his lotus feet, Krishna, whose lotus feet? Krishna's lotus feet, right? And who have become attracted to his name, form, qualities, pastimes, are completely freed from all sinful reactions. They are thus accepted. They have thus accepted the true method of atonement. Even in dreams, such surrendered souls do not see Yamaraj or his order carriers who are equipped with the ropes to bind the sinful. So apparently these messengers of Yamaraj come with ropes. They come with nooses and they lasso the, the soul and they pull it out of the body and they take it to, to hell. And there's a vivid description in the Bhagavatam, in the fifth canto, of the road to hell and uh, the different places that you have to go along to go to hell when you're going along with the Yama Judas. So we don't want to see that. Uh, and those persons who even accidentally or even in dreams um, remember the Supreme Personality of God in Krishna, his name, his form, his quality, his pastimes, they can become completely freed from those sinful reactions. It's the best and truest form of atonement for sins. Continuing on, we have uh, Sarva, Sarva Vipad Vimochakatom. It removes all dangers. Again, we're still talking about the remembrance of the Supreme Person. It removes all dangers. Who better to tell us about the removal of danger than Prahlad? Prahlad is the son of Hiranyakashipu, son of a demon king who hated Vishnu. And his son became a devotee of Vishnu, who was a devotee of Vishnu. Even from, his, from, from before his very birth, he, became a, he was a devotee of Vishnu. And uh, later on, why would Prahlad be in danger? We all know the story that Prahlad was in danger because he was a devotee of Vishnu. And his father was so much against Vishnu that his father... Uh, when he came to understand that Prahlad was a Vaishnava, he wanted to kill Prahlad ultimately. And he put him in so many different dangerous situations, in, uh, in a pit of snakes, tried to have him being stomped on by elephants, tried to throw him off a cliff, tried to drown him, tried to poison him, tried to burn him, tried all these different ways to, to uh, all these different dangerous ways to kill, to kill Prahlad. So the Vishnu Purana, uh, it said, Sri Pallad has said in Vishnu Purana, the tusk of an elephant is harder than a thunderbolt. Right? Everybody knows the elephant has these very big, hard tusks. If it has been broken into pieces, it should be understood that it was not because of my strength. So, Kashipu, he sent these big tuskers, these big elephants with tusks to kill Prahlad. If it has been broken into pieces, it should be understood not to be from his strength, not, not from Prahlad's strength, he says. It's not from my strength that the elephant couldn't hurt me. Rather, it is due to the remembrance of Lord Janardana, who destroys all dangers. And here we have in the last line here, Janardanan, Anusmarna, Anusmarna. Anusmarna means deep meditation. So we had before, in the, we've had before some smarna, and here we have Anusmarna, 
All of these prefixes in Sanskrit are being used to emphasize the word smarna. Deep meditation, deep remembrance, anusmarna, anubhavaha. So anusmarna, uh, no, uh, this is very common uh, that we know that when you get up, we think about the guru, the, the guru and the guru prampara that was described last, last time in our last uh, uh, class. Upon waking, there are certain things to do and remembering the guru prampara is one of them. And this is called anusmarna. Guru Prampra Anusandhanam, Anusmaranam, Anusmaranam, meditation on the Guru Prampra. So here, the specifically in this verse, he says Janardana, Janardana, Janardana. So he's remembering this name of Janardana when he's in danger. I think later on in Hari Bhakti Vilas, I believe in the section which talks about different holy names, it's going to mention that the word Janardana should be used or should be meditated upon or chanted, right? When we're in danger. There's other, there's other names, there's other names of the Lord that can be chanted in different circumstances, but Janardana should be chanted when we're in danger. It's very nice. So continuing on, the Vamana Purana says, sinful reactions, suffering due to natural calamities, and various types of disturbances caused by others, unethical behavior, are quickly removed simply by remembrance of Lord Vishnu. So what does it say here? Uh, it doesn't exactly give the, the breakdown of those, those types. But here, let's look at sinful reactions are things that we have, we have incurred upon ourselves, right? Problems that we've incurred because of our own behavior, right? Bad behavior. Suffering due to natural calamities, which is the uh, problems that we have with the devas or the, the natural natural forces in this world, the demigods, right, right, and various types of disturbances caused by others, by other living entities like other people or mosquitoes or animals or whatever, other sentient beings. These are called adyatmic, adibotic, adidaivic. Adyatmic from our own mind and body, sinful reactions. From the cause caused by our, ourself, by us performing sinful acts, right? Adiyatmic. Adi Baltic is the third type here. Um, various types of disturbances by other Buddhists, other people, other living beings, other sentients like mosquitoes or animals or other people, right? Here it says other, other people's unethical behavior, right? And Adi Daivik, Adi Daivik uh, means natural calamities. You know, flood, fire, um, uh, could be tsunami, cyclone, earthquake, volcano. <laughs> Here in Hawaii, we have volcanoes. So there's, there's many, you know, tidal wave. There's many, many natural calamities, right? Pandemic, we're all suffering from a pandemic. That's a natural calamity, apparently, right? So these are, these are mentioned in the Vedas as three types of what we call klesha, problems. In Hindi, they use the word takali, means difficulties, right? So there are these three, three things, adhyatmic, adibotic, adidaivic. And these three problems are immediately, quickly removed simply by remembrance of Lord Vishnu, simply by the remembrance of Lord Vishnu. In the Vedas, in the Vedic chanting, we chant Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. We want peace. Shanti means peace. We want Shanti. We want three types of peace. We want peace from the Adhyatmic, Adhidaivic, and the Adhibotic. We want peace from our own sinful actions, the reactions to our own sinful activities, right? To our, from our own mind and body. We uh, want peace from other you know, things that are being inflicted on us by other living beings, right? Uh, calamities, and we have natural calamities. These three things. This is why we want peace from these things. How can we get that peace? By simply by remembrance of Lord Vishnu. Simply by remembrance of Lord Vishnu. Every Vedic mantra will start Harihi Om, Oh my Lord Hari. As soon as we say that, if we're chanting any Vedic mantra and we say Harihi Om, immediately we've started with the holy name of the Lord. 
So immediately, everything is perfect. We've removed all our sinful, sin, sinful reactions. And we end off with Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Give peace. Peace, peace, peace. Okay, so continuing on, uh, text 60. Uh, Deva Huti, De Deva Deva Duty, Deva Duty. Hmm. Deva Duty offers this prayer in the Magha Mahatma. Magha is also a, a, a month in the year, it comes after Kartik. Right, we have this Magha uh, section, which is going to have this uh, in uh, December, January, or November, December. Um, in the Padma Purana. So in Padma Purana, there's this section about uh, uh, glorification of the month of Mark, and there's a description here. I offer my obeisances, yes, yes, Maranamatrena. It sounds almost like a verse from Vishnu Sastrana, but anyway, na moho na cha durgalihi na rogo na cha dukani tamanantam namami namami. Maybe it's Namami, Namani, Namani. Namani means a uh, plural of Nam. Okay, Namani, names. I offer my obeisances to the lotus feet of Lord Ananta, means the Supreme Lord, Ananta Unlimited, right? simply by whose remembrance all of one's illusions are eradicated. Sinful reactions are counteracted, disease conditions are removed, and material miseries are vanquished. Okay, so we've got four results here remembering remembering uh lord ananta remembering the supreme lord krishna right uh we get our illusion dispelled we get our sinful reactions eradicated any diseased conditions are removed right diseased or contaminated conditions removed and material miseries vanquished fabulous so just by remembering the lord now, continuing on, text 61, Durvason Mulaton. It destroys all sinful desires. Okay. So, the point here is that one may, just like I was saying about the elephant bathing and coming out and sinning again, uh, or putting dirt on itself after a bath, is like a person who does atonement by remembering the feet of the Lord and gets rid of, nullifies all his sinful reactions, but then again, commits some sinful reaction after that. So the cause of, of sin is the desire, right? What does the uh, Lord Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? He says, there are three gateways to hell. Uh, uh, there are three gateways to hell, lust, anger, and greed. So these are, Sinful desires, the sinful desires that people have, make them to commit sin again, like that. So in the Bhagavatam 12th Canada, 3rd chapter, 42nd verse said that just as fire removes any discoloration from gold. So if you have some, some gold thing, which somehow or other is not colored, then you melt it down and, and recast the gold and it becomes pure again, it becomes uh, nice and shiny again without any discoloration. So just as pure fire removes any discoloration from gold caused by traces of other metals, because actually to make gold into jewelry, you have to mix it with some other metals, usually silver or, or, or copper, and it gets different, slightly different colors by adding different amounts of these other metals. But if you want to purify gold again, you have to heat it, melt it, and separate out these other metals. So just as fire removes any discoloration from gold caused by traces of other metals, Lord Vishnu purifies from within as a super soul, purifies the heart, uh, it, within the heart, purifies the mind of the yogi. Heart and the mind are considered like the same thing. And when we say heart, we mean mind. When we say mind, we mean heart. So the physical heart is not, is not the point, although you know, we can say that the heart and super soul is there within the heart of the living being, but basically the idea is God is within us uh, in the form of a super soul. There's a soul and super soul. In the Upanishads, it's stated, uh, it's said that there's an, it's an analogy that there's two birds in a tree. 
So sometimes we see a green tree and uh, many green leaves and we, and we hear some chirping. And we look and we can't see because the birds are also green. So that's the example given in the Upanishads about the body. We look at the body and we don't see the soul, neither do we see the super soul, but they're there. They're there, the soul is there, the jivatman is there, and the, and, and the paramatman is also there within the soul, within the, within the body. So both the soul and the, they're like two birds in a green tree, two green birds in a green tree, right? So the Lord is there within your heart. And the Lord within your heart is going to purify your heart. It's going to purify your, so the Lord within your mind is going to purify your mind, is the idea. So what does it mean to have the Lord within your mind? It means that you're thinking about the Lord. You're mem remembering the Lord. So, that, so we have to simply remember that the Lord is within us, right, as super soul. And that super soul can purify us in the same way that if we have a problem with, with gold, we can simply heat it and, and melt it and separate any other base metal that's been mixed with it. Text 62. Okay, so now we're listing off some qualities here of remembrance of the Lord. This is all glorification of the remembrance of the Lord. So here we have, first of all, it was said that it destroys all these soul, it destroys all these sins, sinful reactions, it destroys all these different it makes us completely pure here. Then beyond that, it also destroys sinful desire, which is the cause of more sinful reactions or more sins. And then, and then here in, in verse 62, it says it's all auspicious. It's all auspicious, right? So on top of this, on top of it, getting rid of all the sins, right? On top of it, stopping us from having sinful desires, rooting out sinful desires. It's also on top of that, on top of all of that, it's all auspicious. So in the Pandava Gita, it's described. Those who have captured Lord Janardana, who resembles a blue lotus flower, beautiful blue lotus flower, within their hearts, achieve victory and opulence. Where is the question of defeat? Where is the question of defeat? So here's an, an explanation of how, how the Supreme Lord, the remembrance of, Lord, of, of the Lord, who's there within the heart, right? Uh, helps us to achieve opulence, means material opulence, spiritual opulence, and achieve victory. Victory can be also material, it can be also spiritual. Spiritual victory means liberation, means going to, going to Sri Lankanta and serving the Supreme Lord eternally. So text number 63, Sarva Sat Karma, Sarva Sat Karma. Now Sat Karma, Sat means eternal. Sat Karma means good, pious activities. Sarva means all. So all pious activities. Pala means the fruit, right? The results. Pradam. Pradam, Prada means to give. Da means to give. Daiti, like in Diksha. Da. Diete, da. Da means to give. So Pradam. Pra is a suffix. To, so Prada means to give, right? So it, it uh, awards one the result of all pious activities. So in this, so that's another quality of remembrance of the Lord. It gives us the result of all pious activities. Skanda Purana, in the again in the part of Skanda Purana uh, about the month of Kartik, Augustine Muni again says, the results one attains from giving charity following vows, undergoing austerities, visiting holy places, pilgrimage, right? Performing sacrifices, executing welfare activities, like digging wells, opening hospitals, giving to the poor, right? Can be attained simply by remembering the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So simply by remembering Lord Krishna, all of these other things are achieved. That's why it is it result it, it gives the results of all other pious activities. So just like uh, Phil Prophet used to say, pouring water on the root of the tree now nourishes all the leaves of the tree and the branches. So if we go around trying to individually water the leaves and branches, it doesn't work. But if you put it on the root, the root of all existence, the root of everything that is, is Lord Krishna. So simply by remembering Him, 
right? Everything else gets satisfied. Everything else, all these other pious activities are automatically taken care of. So text uh, 64, here's another, another thing that the remembrance of the Lord, uh, another um, quality of the, of the uh, remembrance of the Lord. It surpasses the fruit of all pious activities, right? So not only does it substitute for performing all of these pious activities, we don't have to do all these sacrifices or pilgrimages or austerities, right? Or charities or vows. We don't have to do all those things because simply remembering the Lord satisfies all those things. But not only that, but it actually surpasses doing those things. It is not only, it is not only a substitute, but it is more. It is even more than doing those things. We are better off remembering the Lord than doing all those other things, right? So if we're going to choose an activity to do, somebody might say, okay, so well, if you remember the Lord, do you get the same result as this? But still, you should probably do all these other things. No, why? Because it even surpasses the, the, the result that we get for remembering the Lord, even surpasses all of these activities. Surpasses them, completely outshadows them, uh, outpaces them, overshadows them. It, uh, it surpasses the fruit of all pious activities. So in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, again, it says in Kali Yuga, activities prescribed by the Vedas may or may not yield satisfactory results. Right? So everything you've read about in the Vedas, everything you've read about in the scriptures, right? Unless they specifically say that in Kali Yuga, right, they're going to give you a result. There's many, 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 many things in the scriptures that say by chanting the holy name, by doing certain things in Kali Yuga, you'll get a result. But there are also many things which are given in the scripture, but it never says that in Kali Yuga, you'll get a result from those things. So in Kali Yuga, activities described in the scriptures of the Vedas may or may not yield satisfactory results. Even if those things are to be done in Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga is such an age that you might do those rituals, you might do those things, and you might not get the result, right? Whereas, naturally, if you read the, if the scriptures and you read something to be done, something to be done, you should do it. And in, in, in other ages, it might be much easier to do it and to do it properly. But in Kali Yuga, it's also very difficult to do these things. So some things are difficult. Some things are not prescribed for this age. And yet they're there in the scriptures. So we read those things and we try to do those things. But what it's saying here is you should be careful because sometimes those things will, will give a result. And sometimes they won't give a result. Why? Because if you're, doing, you're trying to do them in Kali Yuga. The nature of the age, the nature of the persons, the nature of the places, the nature of the ingredients. The nature. There's so many problems in Kali Yuga. So they may, these other things may or may not. Right? What are we talking about other things? What is the context of this verse that he's giving? It? The context is he just explained to us all these different things. Right? Charity, vows, undergoing austerities, visiting holy places, performing sacrifices, executing welfare activities. These are all described in the scriptures. Nobody can say that these things are not good things to do because they're there in the scriptures. Can you do them and get the proper result in Kali Yuga? Here he's saying those activities, those pious activities, which you would normally do, which you now realize that you can substitute simply remembering the Lord for, which that your remembrance of the Lord even goes beyond them, right? Even those things, they may not even give you the result to do those things. They may not give you the result. But as far as remembering the Lord is concerned, it always awards one completely satisfying results. So you may or may not do these other things correctly, of giving charity, you know, performing austerities, doing pilgrimages, performing sacrifices, these things may or may not give you the result. We don't know. But remembering Lord Hari will always give you the result. It will always give you completely satisfying results. It is so great. 
So continuing on in verse 65, in the Shmiti literature, Shmiti literature we described about before, it says, the discrepancy of being careless while performing sacrifices. Remember we say, when we're praying for forgiveness at the end of some ritual, we say, mantrahinam, kriyahinam, bhaktihinam, janardana, right? We say, oh, janardana, mantrahinam. If I made a hinam, a mistake in the mantra, mantrahinam, kriyahinam. If I made a mistake in the procedure, bhaktihinam, if I don't have any devotion, if I did this without devotion, or if I did any step of this without any devotion, or I made a mistake in my devotion, right? Mantrahinam, kriyahinam, bhaktihinam, janardana, right? Please forgive all that and make it all full. Make it purna, make it complete. So here he's saying the discrepancy of being careless when performing sacrifices, mantrahinam, kriyahinam, bhaktihinam, and other ritualistic activities can be immediately counteracted simply by remembering Lord Vishnu, which is what that verse before, Sri Krishna Anusmaranam Param, was, was before. That's what it's for. At the end, we say, Shri Krishna Anusmaranam Param, Shri Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. And we chant some, the Smartas are even, they're even more into this. The Vaishnavas will say, Shri Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. The Smartas will chant 10 times. Shri Krishna, 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 Krishna. They'll chant 10 times, Krishna, to remember Lord Krishna at the end of the ceremony. Why? Why do they do that? Do they think that they didn't do things correctly? Even if they did things correctly, they get a better result just from that last sloka, just from chanting the holy name at the end there, than the whole ritual that they perform. That's confirmed here by the scriptures. And what to speak of trying to do those things properly in Kali Yuga, they may or may not get the result from the ceremony. So whenever we perform a ritual, we always say at the end, Shri Krishna Anasmaranam Param, Shri Krishna Krishna Krishna. We always say this at the end. Why? Because we don't know if we got a result or not a result from that ritual. We don't know. That's what it said here. You don't know. In Kali Yuga, the, the, the activities which are prescribed in the Vedas and the Shastras, right? They may or may not yield your result. So I'm not saying you shouldn't follow those things. You should. You should follow the directions of the scriptures. But you don't know all these other directions of all these doing these things, whether, that, whether you're going to get a result or not. Therefore, you should always, always add the remembrance of the Supreme Lord. Always add the remembrance of the Supreme Lord in everything that you do, because then you, you, not only do you get the, the, the result of that activity, but you get even more than the result of that activity that was proved by these, these slokas. By these verses. Okay, here's another. Here's another quality of remembrance of the Supreme Lord. Sarva kamadi adikatvam. It is superior to all kinds of pious activities. Well, that was explained before. Okay, the result is superior, but therefore, if the result is superior, therefore it is superior. The remembrance of the Supreme Lord is superior, superior to all these other activities. Right. So in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, in the part about Kali Yuga, there's a, there's a section about uh, Kali Yuga in, in, in the Brihad Naradiya Purana, in the big Naradiya Purana, O best of the Brahmanas, giving a great deal of wealth in charity, performing Rajasurya sacrifice, which is a very big yaga, very big sacrifice, normally done by king, Forming an ashramada sacrifice. The ashramada sacrifice is a horse sacrifice. And if you do 100 of those, you can even be elevated to the heavenly planets and become Indra. So these are all, these are all huge charity, huge sacrifices, right? Are not equal. These things, these huge sacrifices, giving huge amounts of wealth, right, in, in, in charity, none can be equated with simply remembering Lord Krishna or remembering Lord Vishnu here. Right? Palam Vishnu Smriti, Samam, Samam, Samam means equal. They are not equal. They are not equal. Samam na, Samam na jatu vijasitama. Right? They are not equal to remembering Lord Vishnu. Right? 
Remember, Lord Vishnu is greater, is what they're saying. He's greater than these things. So another, uh, in 67, there's another quotation from Shura Bhagavatam, 12th Canto, 3rd chapter, 48th verse. It says, by one's engaging in the process of demigod worship or devata puja, austerities, breath control, pranayama, right, which we're going to learn about later on in uh, probably in the fifth vilas, uh, bathing in holy places, strict vows, and Hari Bhakti Vilas is full of all these, all these things, charity giving, chanting of various mantras, One's mind cannot attain the same absolute purification that as that achieved when the unlimited personality of God it appears in one, one's heart, which means when we remember him. Right? So this whole book, Hari Bhakti Vilas, is going to be filled with all these sort of rituals, all these sort of austerities, breath control, um, talking about going to different holy places of, of different vows and charities and different mantras to be chanted. But they cannot, cannot equal, they can't, none of these things can equal the absolute purification achieved by simply remembering the Supreme Personality of God. Continuing on, another quality of this, of Lord Vishnu is, it destroys all types of fear. So not only it has you get all these results, but the other thing is if you're fearful, if you have some fear, remember Prahlad, this is again going to be by Prahlad. Prahlad was, he wasn't fearful, of course, because he had complete, he had complete trust in the Supreme Lord. He had great faith. So he wasn't fearful, but we may find ourselves in a position of being fear, of, of, of fearing. And in fact, all of us here in this material world, we fear uh, Jara, Vyadi, by, a, by a, a birth, death, old age, disease. These are fears for everybody in this material world. If you're born, you die. If you die, you're going to be reborn again because of karma. Right? So all these, all these things that happen to us, we have to fear. So how do we get rid of all that fear? Simply by remembering the Lord. So again, from Vishnu Purana, Prahlad says to Hiranyakashipu, his demoniac father, the devotee Prahlad says, my dear father, I have nothing to fear because Lord Ananta, the unlimited Lord, whose remembrance removes all kinds of fearful conditions, such as birth and old age. What was I saying? Birth and old age, right? Birth, death, disease, old age. These are everybody's fears. There might be other fears, but these are our basic fears. Is residing in my heart. Because Prahlad was thinking about the Lord within his heart, because he was remembering the unlimited Lord, right? Why is he unlimited? He has unlimited forms. He has unlimited names. He has unlimited pastimes. He is totally unlimited. He is spread everywhere, right? He's all pervading. He's unlimited in so many ways, in every way. He's unlimited in unlimited ways, right? And the law, and because Prahlad was meditating upon him, that destroys all the fear that Prahlad had. Prahlad didn't have any fear because he's pure body, but all the fears that we can have of birth, death, disease, and old age, Prahlad is saying those fears will simply go away by simply rem remembering the Lord. On top of that, on top of all of those things, the quality is given by remembering the Lord of liberation. It just awards the liberation. Which, which is the ultimate purusharta, the ultimate goal of human life, right, is to serve the Supreme Lord in loving service to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan, right? That's the aim. That's the aim of the living being. Loving service, Krishna Prema, loving service to the Supreme Lord in Goloka Vrindavan. So, moksha pradatum means gives moksha, gives liberation, right? A person, and this is a slogan from somewhere else. We don't know exactly where this, um, this quotation is from. A person whose heart is purified of all sinful propensities as a result of remembering Lord Vishnu is qualified to attain liberation. A person whose heart gets purified from all sinful propensities. Remember, we were talking about sinful desires being eradicated by remembrance of the Lord. 
So when your mind or your heart becomes purified by remembrance of the Lord, of those desires, not also the reactions, but also the desire to, to, to again sin, right? Sinful propensities attains liberation. So when you're freed from sin, sinful reaction, and freed from the desire for more sin, then you're liberated. You're going to be liberated. For such a person, the attainment of heavenly planets is simply an impediment. So remember we were talking about the ashramata sacrifice. You can become, if you do 100, you can become, get the post of Indra. Who would want, it, who would want that? What Vaishnava would want that? That's simply an impediment from him, for him to going back to Godhead, going to Goloka Vrindavan and serving the Supreme Lord, you know, lovingly serving the Supreme Lord. That's simply an impediment. So all these other results, you realize, you come to realize that all these other results are an impediment. So first of all, it's interesting the, 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 way, he's, the way he's giving these, these quotes, because he's starting off by saying, by remembering the Lord, you get the same result as doing all these other things like your charity and, and penance and austerity and sacrifices. But he ends up saying, you're even going to, eventually you're going to think of these things, the results of these things as being impediments. Why do you want the result of these sacrifices? You may do a sacrifice or do a, give charity or do, uh, perform some austerity or some vow. Why do you want that? That's just an impediment, that result. Why? You don't want that result. All you want is Krishna Prema. All you want is to lovingly serve the Supreme Person eternally in Vaikuntha. Right? So for you, you should understand that it's got the remembrance of the Lord is going to give you that. It's going to award you liberation. It's going to award you the highest thing. It's all these other results are going to be seen like an impediment. Now, another one from Brihad Narada Purana, verse te text 70 here, explains. By remembering the personality of Godhead, who is the absolute supreme absolute truth, who awards benedictions to all who approach him, who is the primeval Lord, who manifests the planets by effulgence emanating from his transcendental body, right, and who awards the fruit of one's desires, anyone can achieve liberation. Right? So, so by remembering the supreme personality of Godhead, or Krishna, Anyone can achieve, achieve liberation. And then several qualities of the unlimited qualities of the Lord are explained. He is the supreme absolute truth. He awards benedictions to all those who approach him. He is the primeval Lord. He's the cause of all causes. Who manifests, he manifests the, the planet. So he creates the universe from his, by the effulgence emanating from his transcendental body. Right? He's different. There's a system of creation, which we don't need to go into, but anyway. Uh, and who awards the fruits of one's desires. So all of your desires are awarded by God anyway, right? So he's, in, in all the actions, and Bhagavad Gita describes that there are five, there are five uh, aspects to every action. One of them is the Supreme Lord. Without him, nothing happens. So uh, the, the, all these different, uh, appellations, all these different names of the Lord, all these different uh, qualities of the Lord are being explained. But the point is, if we remember the Lord by any of these qualities or any of his unlimited qualities, pastimes, names, forms, you know, or, or mantras, right, we'll achieve liberation. We'll achieve liberation. Continuing on. So we'll have uh, a section here. We'll get to a section where we're going to stop very soon. Uh, Text 71 from the Skanda Purana, it says, I offer my obeisances unto the op most opulent personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu. By remembering him, one can be delivered from the vicious cycle of repeated birth and death within the material nature. Well, that's just explaining liberation. That's liberation means to be uh, delivered from the cycle of birth and death in the material nature. Number 72, in the Kartik, again, the Kartik section of Skanda Purana, Parasara Muni says, there's no doubt that if one remembers Sri Hari, that with great devotion, he'd be liberated from all miseries, such as birth, death, and old age. Correct. 73, Bhavat Prasadhanam. It pleases the Supreme Lord. Right? So on top of giving liberation, 
the next quality of remembrance of the Supreme Lord is not only that, but it pleases the Supreme Lord. It itself is a type of service to the Lord to, to remember him. Just to remember him is a service to him, is pleasing to him. So in the Brihad Narodiya Purana, it says, if somehow or other, Lord Narayan is remembered even by the most sinful, even, then even the most sinful person can achieve his mercy. So he feels indebted to people who remember him, the Supreme Lord. It's a type of service uh, to the Supreme Lord and enables one to go back to home, back to Godhead. So in the Vamana Purana, it says, those who constantly remember Sri Hari, this is uh, text 74, um, the beginningless unlimited Supreme Lord who trans is transcendently situated beyond this world of death, attain the eternal, original, inexhaustible abode of the Vaishnavas. Baba Purana, Deva Dutta, okay. While chastising, while chastising his messengers, Sri Yamaraj made the following statement in the conversation between Deva Dutta and Vikundala uh, in the Pabba Purana. Oh, messengers, the sinful reactions of those who remember Lord Keshava, even once, are completely destroyed. And so such persons return to his abode at the time of death. Not to Yamaraja's abode, but to the abode of Lord Krishna. In the, in the Brahma Purana, Vishnu Rahasya section, which means the secrets of Vishnu, right? It says those who even neglectfully remember Lord Janardana, right? This is what, again, back to the Bhagavatam, Sankhya Pariyasyam in the sixth canto verse, right? Even neglectfully or accidentally or joking around, right? One remembers Lord Janardana, Vishnu becomes free from all faults, and after giving up their present bodies, those persons attain the abode of the Lord. And similarly in the Vishnu Dharmotra in text 77, it says, one who meditates on Lord Vishnu, being freed from material attachment and, and material desires, certainly attains the abode of the Lord Vishnu, which is devoid of lamentation and all kinds of miseries. Swarupya Praptam. So it, now it's going to be talking about what type of liberation is, does a person get? There are different types of liberation. There are these four types of liberation, five, five types if you, encounter, if you include uh, Kaivalya, which is an impersonal type of liberation. But you've got Saropya, Saropya, Salopya, Samitya, and Sarshti, right? Uh, this is also described in the Bible, the four types of liberation. So... Uh, in verse 78, it says that it awards one the liberation of attaining the same bodily features of the Lord. So in the Kashi Kanda, about Kashi again, Sri Bindu Madhava, which is a deity in Kashi uh, section, Agni Bindu Stuti. There's a, there's a, a prayer for the Agni Bindu, for the uh, prayer. It says, O Trivikrama, O Lotus Eyed Lord. Your complexion is just like the color of the sky. Your yellow garments are just like the color of lightning. Those who always meditate on you within their hearts attain that same transcendental complexion. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says, Antakalis, Shamameva, Smaramukta Kalevaram, this is text 79. And whoever at the end of his life quits his body, remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this, there is no doubt. Right? So one attains the same nature as the Supreme Lord. It, mind you, you know, we have the same qualities. We have many of the same qualities as the Supreme Lord, and we attain in a minute form, we attain those qualities. Uh, in verse 80, she, it controls the Supreme Lord. He feels like he's controlled by those persons, those devotees who remember him. So this is from Srimad Bhagavatam, also 10th Canto, 80th uh, chapter. Verse 11, since he gives even his own self to anyone who simply remembers his lotus feet, what doubt is there that he, the spiritual master of the universe, that is the Supreme Lord, will bestow upon his sincere worshiper prosperity and material enjoyable, enjoyment, which are, not, which are not even very desirable. Not even very desirable. The devotee doesn't desire those things, material enjoyment and material prosperity. But the Lord even provides those. Devotees. 